I am so proud and happy and excited to introduce my longtime very good friend, Afu Richardson, who is a superstar on many different levels, and I'm a huge fan, and I will let you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us more about you. Thanks so much for having me. Um, as Barry said, my name is Afu Richardson, and I am a comic book illustrator and a musician, and writer, and uh, mentor as best I can. Um, I've been in the comic book industry for about 14 years, but I've been a lifelong fan. And um, I started off as a musician, actually. I was a classy flautist. And uh, I started off at nine and uh, ended up at LaGuardia for the performing arts and did part-time at, at Juilliard, like an undergrad at Juilliard. And um, art was always something that was a... A meditation for me it was it was the one little bit of peace I could find in in my world there was a lot of chaos in my house but everybody has their stories so um, my my mom was mentally ill and uh, she was a clinical psychopath which made it very difficult to have any peace wow. or any kind of um, grounding in our home. Um, and I felt like art and music was the place where there was beauty and peace. I thought, you know, I know there's canned food flying and boiling water and punches and chairs being thrown, like that's the WWE in here, but somebody somewhere made this really beautiful song and it's giving me peace you know and I know they didn't have an easy life either I you know I'll listen to these old jazz songs and I thought man they endured horrible times but they still made this and it changed the world in my mind and I wanted to make that world real or at least contribute to it and so I thought okay well I don't know how to draw, but at one point I didn't know how to play the flute either. And I just, I want to be really good at this because I feel like here I can say what I can't say verbally. I can express what isn't hurt. And I can make what I want here. Whatever I feel is missing, if there's not enough this, if there's not enough you know, representation, if I don't see enough people with this kind of body type or whatever it is, I don't have to get mad. I see it as an opportunity and I get creative. So in high school, I, um, I was always carrying around a sketchbook. I would draw people on the subway on my commute to school faces because nobody looks at each other on New York City subways. Everybody's just kind of looking up in every other direction. So I would carry around my book and I try to capture faces as fast as I could before they spotted me. And sometimes they would, uh, and I'd you know, cut it out and I'd give it to them or um, they would just kind of go on their way. And um, after a while, I was one of the only musicians in my circle of friends. Um, I joined this all-female hip hop crew called the Anomalies that were e-girls and break dancers and well, it's one of the same, uh, MCs and graffiti artists. And I was their resident beatbox artist and uh, anime artist. I was really into manga. So I would draw all the flyers and things like that for the events. And I'd draw characters and, uh, um, you know, and, and perform with these amazing ladies at all these different venues. And um, I started background singing and I went on tour and I got to perform with uh, just some amazing creative uh, Alicia Keys, Sheila E, Parliament Funkadelic, Outcast. I, I just, I thought to myself, man, you know, just a couple of years ago, I didn't have a place to stay. I was hopping from couch to couch and just, you know, sleeping on a subway. And, and now I'm like a few feet away from, you know, one of the most amazing musicians of all time. How did I, how did I get here? Um, after that, I, um, I started getting into commercial voice acting. I had a lot of friends who were producers and then joined a jingle house. And, uh, all the while I was 
drawing and teaching myself Photoshop. I had a lot of office jobs that had Photoshop on uh, the office computers. And so there were very limited tutorials then. So I tried whatever, uh, whatever tangible mediums like watercolor and things like that. I tried to translate that into a digital format and learn the limitations and my limitations uh, of the programs and turn that into graphic design and got hired to do album covers and logos and tattoos anybody wants a tattoo and uh after that um i took a i took my first vacation when i was 27 <laughs> to san diego comic-con and uh, i thought man what an amazing opportunity because in the music industry, you have to speak to uh, a rep, then an A&R, and then you might get a meeting if they listen to your demo. And then you have a showcase, and if they like you, then they might give you a shot. But at a comic convention, you can just walk right up to the CEO of Marvel, the CEO of Top Cow, Image, Image Comics. Todd McFarlane is walking around, the creator of Spawn. You know, when he was alive, you could just there is Stan Lee. You'll have to wait on the line. But imagine if you could just walk up to an incredible musician and the head of like a major music production <laughs> company, just right there. You can ask them questions. You know, you, you might have a limited amount of time. But I was like, man, this is incredible. Like, I can just walk right up to these people and, and leave an impression, hopefully. And I also understood they were there to sell books. So I walked up to Mark Silvestri, who is the head of, of Top Cow and one of the founders of Image Comics. Image Comics, if you don't know, is uh, the three of the big three. There's Marvel, there's DC, and there's Image. It's the first sort of independent breakaway publisher uh, from the top seven artists at Marvel and DC. So Todd McFarlane and Jim Lee and all of these different creators who were producing 90% of the content that sold the top 40 titles decided to create their own because they were doing all of this work and had no personal investment in the property. They didn't own it. So it's, it's amazing to draw Black Panther. It's amazing to draw these different properties, but if you don't own it, there's no residuals for you. So it's just kind of a a uh, hand-to-mouth situation. Uh, as Todd McFarlane said, he's like, where's my watch? My dad worked at a factory for 40 years and he got a watch. I don't even get a watch. <laughs> you know, so that kind of, of uh, entrepreneurial spirit really inspired me. So I, I spoke to um, Mark Silvestri, who was one of the, the founders there, and I handed him a postcard, a really large, bright and colorful postcard with my favorite of mine uh, pieces at the time and where he could find me. And he looked at it and he was just like, I've seen this stuff before. I was like, yes, littering the, the internet with my work and hashtags has worked, but I'm going to keep cool. <laughs> and so I said, can I buy something? Can I, you know, I, I, I want to support you. And hey, if you need a colorist or anything like that, I know I'm, I'm pretty new to the industry, but uh, this is where you can find me. And um, I bought a book, got it signed, and, and I didn't really expect them to like look through my giant portfolio and tell me what was wrong with my work because they've been on their feet for eight hours. I try to be considerate of creators in their time. So I handed them you know, my postcard, got the book signed, walked away, and six months later, I got asked to do my first cover-to-cover -cover comic book all by myself, and I was terrified, <laughs> but I made it through it. So Genius, um, which was about a 17-year-old tactical genius who wages war on uh, the LAPD. Uh, it was a little bizarre because it ended up coming out just a week before the events at Ferguson, Missouri. And I worked on it for uh, quite some time and it won a few awards, but it was able to start a larger conversation about police brutality, the cyclical nature of public school to jail, and uh, some issues that are within the Black community that have a negative, uh, a negative direction that gets embraced 
you know, that jail is a part of the rite of passage, that um, foster care doesn't always care for the children it, it uh, has in its custody. And just being able to have a conversation through something that I drew was amazing for me. And I thought, man, this is a really powerful medium. It's not like film or anything else where you can, where all of the senses are given to you, minus smell. Um, you can, you, you hear the, you hear the actors, you, you see the color palettes, you have sound, but with a comic book, all you have are these word bubbles and the panels that you create and the mind fills in the blank, the mind fills in the emotion. So I thought that, man, this is very unique and it engages your audience in a way that I don't think anything else really does. You, you offer the palette and, and you create the voices in your mind. You, you create the scene and the feeling. And as you learn your craft and as you learn all of these different things to make your story connect with your audience, you see how you can be of service with your work, not just create something and make money. That's great. We need money. We need to pay bills. That is absolutely fantastic. But you're also providing a service just like a doctor or an architect. And you're creating a different reality that your audience will or will not accept. But you're also creating possibility. You're creating a scenario where you know, it, it may help them see something in their own lives that they may not be able to resolve and it may give them the inspiration to find a solution uh, in the really real world off the paper. So um, some of the projects that I got to work on were uh, Black Panther World of Wakanda, uh, X-Men 92, Totally Awesome Hulk. Um, I'm also a part of the upcoming HBO uh, Jordan Peele and Misha Green series called Lovecraft Country. Uh, where I got to ghost art for some of the actors. They're kind of the old comic nerds. And um, I was drawing for the actors uh, in the series. And I feel really fortunate that I got to, uh, that, I, that I, I, I get asked to do these kinds of projects. But there are a lot of things I still need to learn. It's an ever growing process. There are some things that I just, I realize I'm like, man, I am completely unknowledgeable in this area and I, I need to know it because it's not always the easiest being an artist and a business person at the same time. We're taught often to take, to do art seriously, but not take it seriously and we feel guilt sometimes associated with making a profit from creation but like i said before we artists are providing a service so i want to um you know i was talking with barry about the format of this but i want to um give a, a few statements about the things that really helped me become a pro and get my work seen. And in addition to that, I want to open up um, questions, like open up the floor to questions and sort of answer in line, um, maybe in the chat. Um, if you have any questions for me, uh, if there's something you're just like, okay, I, I'm really stuck on this and I don't know how to get past it, please, by all means. Um, so uh, the first thing that I think really helped me, one, be taken seriously as an artist, and two, um, really make it easy to get my work out there was a website. And I know that's pretty standard issue stuff, but um, how your website is designed is how you're perceived as an artist. You know, when I had just kind of a, a basic website and it was very cluttered and you know, it was just Tumblr and there were a whole bunch of things all over the place, then I got a lot of lowball offers. It said to my clients, okay, 
you know, she has skill and I want to hire her, but, you know, maybe not worth what she's asking for. When I change the design and format of my website to A, be responsive, which means that anytime someone goes to it, whatever device they see it on, it changes according to that device. Um, WordPress definitely helped me with that. Um, it said to my clients, can I afford you? Which is great. That's what you want. <laughs> you want to be at a place where even if you're still learning, there, there are things that you, you know, you're, you're still trying to figure out. It says, hey, you know what? If I invest in this person, they're going to invest in me. And, you know, I'm, I'm willing to put down the money to uh, take what it is that they've developed and have them make that for me. Um, in addition to that, I started um, making little postcards and stickers and just leaving them around. Like just something that I would wanna put on a wall and then on the reverse, or if you wanted to make it one-sided, just my website. And in the website, I have a place where they can contact me. If you don't want people to have your general email, uh, that's fine. Just make one where people can reach you. Something you love that you feel represents you, where they can find it. And, you know, I just, I kept going into coffee shops and it's, it's a different world. So maybe we can't necessarily do that now. Um, but I, um, there's some, there's some way to apply the same, you know, methodology, I'm sure. Exactly. In, in the digital world, um, I started tagging uh, all of my artwork and even in the descriptions of the artwork itself, like in the name of the file, I put my name and what it was. Because as people are searching online, Google will scan a page to, to see, okay, does this content have what they're looking for? And there are also ways for you to be able to search through Google as to what people are searching for precisely. So that ups your chances of your work being seen. So your SEO optimization, your search engine optimization definitely helps um, not only whatever it is that you love to draw, you know, tag the heck out of it. You love drawing robots? Draw you some robots because that's what you'll get hired to do. Because even when you're not in the mood to do this and you're like, man, I just, I'm not feeling very great today. <laughs> I'm not really feeling up to this, but I have work to do. That love of that thing that you want to create and share with other people will carry you through that deadline. And sometimes you have to just go out and revitalize yourself. You can't give what you don't have. So you got to take a walk. You've got to move your body. You have to change your mind in order to change your hands. And that's something that I have to combat with all the time. If I'm sitting too much at my desk, then I'm just giving, 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 and I'm not putting back. So I have to listen to music. I've got to move. I've got to like refill my memory banks with things so I can give to the art. I can't just sit here and let my legs atrophy. It's kind of like the, the hero's journey um, where we have the stasis, the norm, the, the everyday life. This is you either at whatever phase you are at in your work. And there's something that you want to achieve, whatever that is for you, write it down. You know, you're, you're a creator. We make, we make things happen. And sometimes thinking about it and letting it swim in our heads too much, it doesn't allow us to see the steps in order to make it real. So what I like to do you know, every month or so, I kind of revisit it every couple of days, is I'll make a list of things that I need. Um, new socks, eggs, more memory for my computer, um, better headphones, whatever it is that you need that is getting in the way of things being easier for you. I need to organize my, uh, my artwork. Uh, I, I want, and then things that you want. I want to be better at drawing hands. I want to um, be a better colorist, inker, um, any of those things that you want, put that in the next list. And then last, things that you dream about, things that sound really, really far off in the distance and almost impossible. 
you'll start realizing that it's not actually that far. But because, you know, we are caught up in the day to day and the, the mundane, we don't allow ourselves to visualize and reach those things. So in the middle column is kind of where I put a lot of my focus. I make sure I get the things that I need and I'll check them all and then kind of revisit the list. But the things that I want, whether it's a skill or a tool that will help me develop my skill, those are where I put my focus for my small goals. So even if your small goals are, I want to make a four page comic book, I wanna make a graphic novel, break it up into pieces. Break it up into different types of tasks from the script to the thumbnails to um, you know, discover where you may want to publish this. Um, creating those small goals will, one, help you feel a little better about progress because when you have those giant projects where you're like, this is going to be my magnum opus, 500 pages of comic book glory, it can be a little daunting. <laughs> you're like, I'm never going to make it. Why would anyone want my work when they can just go to this other person who's absolutely amazing? Why? Because what you have to say is so needed your experience, your life, the things that you bring to the table. Someone really needed to hear that that day. Like that song that I listened to when, you know, my mom decided to pick up a chair and smash it over my back. I put on Stevie Wonder and I just kind of sat back and thought, man, this is so beautiful. Look at, look, listen to these chord progressions, listen to this, these lyrics, this melody, like this is, incredible. I, I want to make this, you know, I want to be a part of, of this. I want to make something that's mine that makes someone else feel like this, regardless of what they've just experienced. So I was supposed to be drawing while I'm running my mouth. <laughs> and I totally forgot. Maybe you can draw a little for us while we, while we, you know, while we go over some questions. I don't want to, if okay. you have more to say, like, we'd love to hear more if there's, you know. I don't know. Um, what time is it? How are we doing? Uh, it's only one we We're good. We're okay. good. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Let me open up Photoshop. New. Um, while you're while you're doing that, um, mm -hmm. I just want to bring bring it back to the discussion we were having before we came on officially mm -hmm. about the hero's journey, and yes. it was sort of a, a reiteration of something that we've gone over, you know, um, kind of a few times in this program so far. But um, it related to what you were saying too, uh, is the idea that we have these sort of points of arrival that we assume are going to look a certain way. We think that once we do a certain amount of work and we do, you know, we get recognized at a certain level, blah, 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 then we will have arrived. Like if I, do, if I like, you know, work for, you know, if I play at the King's Theater, I've arrived. So if I'm Madison Square Garden, you know, if I have a piece of music that's used in a movie that I see on a screen, or if I mm -hmm. print something to vinyl or whatever, you know, whatever your abstract goal is, right? ultimately really has nothing to do, not nothing to do. It's good because it, you know, but those are, those are, footholds along the way, but um, I know these aren't my feet, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying? That we get there and then we're like, wait a minute. And it's, the, you know, just like the Odyssey, it's like you get there, just like you said, at noon, once the character gets to noon, they're supposed to have arrived at their goal, but then they're supposed to realize that it's not what they thought it was. And then they have to retool and figure out and look at themselves differently in order to move on and realize, you know, how, where, where the next step is, or e even how high the mountain is. Absolutely. And, and the points in the hero's journey are, are kind of formulaic when you really, when you really look at it, uh, you kind of start with a, the, the norm, the stasis, the everyday uh, life, and then the norm is interrupted. There's something that comes in, there's a, an event, a person, um, or whatever, whether it's fictional or it's something within your life uh, that has disrupted you or there's a need. 
you need to figure something out and you are presently not the person that you need to be in order to get what it is that you want. And that doesn't mean that you're not enough. That just means that you need to change, just like your character. Something needs to happen to them for them to understand, all right, there are things that I need to develop in order for me to have the life that I want. And a lot of times they might not know what that is. And that's when the herald comes in. The herald is the person who gives the call to adventure. And that can take a lot of different shapes because sometimes we don't know what it is that we don't know. And so they'll tell you, okay, well, you have to learn this spinny move and you need to get the golden sword in order for you to, to defeat the dragon that has invaded your town. And so your sword may be a, you know, study of anatomy, whatever it is, that's an obstacle between you and that objective. You need to go out and find the herald or the teacher that helps you get to that point. So that's the normal C is at 12 o'clock and now uh, heading to the, the call to adventures, maybe around you know, two o'clock and then three, that's when you start your journey. So at three o'clock, that's when the introduction of new characters or helpful characters comes in. The people and the relationships that move your story along or your own personal journey along that help you get to your goal, which is at noon. So at noon, not noon, I'm sorry, at six o'clock. <laughs> six o'clock is halfway through your journey. Uh -huh. And at that point, you are faced with a critical choice. Now, in your storytelling, in your artwork, and whatever it is, if you're creating dialogue, whatever is said by your characters, it either does two things. Tells your audience what this character is about, or it moves the story along. And if it doesn't do either of those two things, consider cutting it out. Because you don't wanna have just idle chat if you're making a, a book. Um, so um, as you're moving your story along and you get to that critical choice, it says, okay, this is who the character is. This is who they are on the inside. Will they sacrifice? Will they do the, the, the hard thing or will they maybe take the easy way and then have to pay for that choice? And usually when you're reading or you're watching stories, you're watching film, you'll see that they, they get to the seemingly you know, uh, desired solution, but it's not what they thought it was. And the same thing kind of goes for your journey as well. Like sometimes you'd be like, yeah, this is it. I work for this company. And it's not everything that you thought it was. It's like, all right, I've made it to Marvel. Why am I not a bajillionaire? <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Where's my what? bajillion dollar check? Exactly. Yeah. That's because our, our goal was, our, our objective was to work for another company instead of being our own company. That it's not a destination but just to stop on the train and that your goals are always going to change especially as you change and your philosophy changes and what change you want to see in the world changes you're going to reflect that in your work as well and so as you're moving along and you get from you know six o'clock and you're getting to nine that's when it gets really difficult <laughs> <laughs> really, really difficult. You'll get to the death portion. This is the lowest point sometimes, and you'll reach that point as you go along. I um, I had gotten an email a couple of months ago, and um, I'm going to share my screen. Oops. I think uh, you need to enable me to share a screen in order for me to oh, do that. Seiji, Seiji, are, are you there? I think Seiji needs to do yeah, that. Yeah, I am here. Okay, okay no can you enable Afua to share her screen, please? All right, yeah. Uh, just made you as a co-host, so you should be able to share that now. Oh, thank you. Let's see, I'm going to Photoshop. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes. Okay. Cool. Well, we only see it. Yeah, it's just, it's just gray, yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> 
Rachel. Um, I got an email a couple of months ago and uh, it was from a gentleman claiming to be um, a, an editor from GQ Mexico teaming up with Marvel Comics. And these were two companies that I had worked with before. And uh, I thought, this is fantastic. Like they said, open budget. We want three images and we're so excited to have you. And we would, uh, you, you name your price. This is our deadline. Um, we would just, we've seen your work. We would love if you would work with us on this project. And I thought, oh my gosh, this, this is fantastic. My first mistake was I didn't check the email suffix. Normally, if you're working with a company uh, and not an individual, they will have an, a company email. So it'll be whatever their name is, dot, you know, um, Condé Nast dot, dot com or marvel.com or, or anything else. And this one was max.gq dot com or whatever it was and uh i thought ah, that's i'm being judgmental i have a gmail account and i'm a real person that's great um and so i thought okay you know um open budget i can i'm gonna make sure that i, I take a look at the contract and, and make sure it's cool uh and everything looked pretty standard issue to me, but I didn't send it to my lawyer. Uh, and a couple of years ago, I, I hired a lawyer to look over some things for me. He's expensive, mm. <laughs> as lawyers are, but uh, every time I've worked with him, I have not regretted it because he would negotiate terms for me that I wouldn't even think of because there's a language with legalese that you can, you can absolutely miss uh, just being involved in the uh, in the creative end. So um, I thought, well, you know, I don't, I don't need him for this. This is this is fine. I'll I'll be okay. And so I, I did the work. I turned it in on time. They kind of asked for a ridiculous deadline, as most uh, as most companies do. They want everything yesterday. Uh, you also have to know how fast you can work guys don't mm. don't just take a job and then put yourself in a bad situation where you can't deliver know how long it takes for you to do something and if they're rushing you along then you have to kind of charge for that rush um but anyway uh i get a message right after i turn in the work and uh it's from a, a colleague and they said, uh, oh, hey, I reached out to the real Jose Fortiza, and he said that that was a scam. And I said, what? Oh, did somebody, like, you know, leak the, uh, leak the project to other people, and, and they're, they're pretending to be on board with this? They were like, no, 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 there was never a Marvel... Uh, Association? Uh, there was never like a Marvel GQ crossover. Um, they took the name of a real editor and uh, just, I don't really know why they wanted your bank information because Condé Nast has a portal that they work through. But um, yeah, this we're not going to be getting paid for this. And I had turned down other projects. Uh, rent was due Ooh. that day. And uh, I was so angry. I was so, <laughs> I was so angry. And I, two weeks ago, right? Two weeks ago, yeah. All right, at the beginning of uh, July. Yeah, okay, so four weeks ago. Yeah, and I was like, you know, I thought with all of these projects that I'd worked on, all of these things that I've been doing, that I would be immune to things like this, that I would be smart enough to know when I was being had. Yeah, like I wouldn't, I would be smarter than this. But, you know, I, I actually, it, it made me so angry that I was like, what is the point of doing this? Like, this is, 
this is really hard work and I don't always get paid what it is that I think I deserve for the time and effort that I put into, you know, bettering myself and my craft, you know, what, what is the point of all of this? And, uh, which by the way, thanks for the love rate for your time right now. We very much appreciate you. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, that's one thing that I, I really like to do because that's what was done for me. I going to all of these comic book conventions, I got to speak to creatives. That was one of the things in addition to a website and always carrying a sketchbook and, you know, creating postcards and media and things like that. That was something that I think really, um, really helped me grow was just speaking to professionals and hearing what their paths were like because everyone's journey was different. Yeah. Uh, Neil Adams went through uh, commercial storyboarding. That's where he got most of his money, actually. He, um, he really, really loved comics and he thought there was a whole lot of money in it, but in the beginning, just like any entry level, it's not going to pay what you need in order to help you survive. So every job that he had from storyboarding commercials to, um, to creating you know, graphic, graphic design elements and websites and business cards, all of those things helped him develop as an artist. There wasn't a job that he had that he felt was a waste of time because, you know, and I, I could definitely say the same for myself. If I'm, if I'm bartending for a few years while I figure out how to get a better computer, then I'm learning how to speak to people. I'm learning how to be there for people and speak to anyone and be able to relate to anyone. Because a lot of times if someone's, you know, in a place drinking by themselves, they got some stuff on their mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Boy, yeah. And um, I even have uh, friendships to this day from the people who uh, were some of my bartending customers and you never know who you're talking to. There was a guy who would come in every two or three days. And if he was having a good day, he would have a, a martini. If he was having a bad one, he'd order a Manhattan. And so um, him and his business partner, um, they had a large IT company. And uh, the person who he would come in with was actually the CEO of the largest uh, Black-owned media company in the world. And I had no idea. They were just coming in to get a margarita. <laughs> and, uh, but I was kind to them and I would listen. And whenever they had an event, I made sure they were taken care of. And that's what you want. You want to create an experience with not only your art, but the people who you interact with, because they're going to be the ones who support you, your friends and the people who you create an experience with when you interact with them as they interact with your work. Those are going to be the people who support your endeavors. Now, it definitely helps being uh, a part of a major project like Black Panther, but how do you get there? How do you get these companies to give you a chance? Um, one of the things that I think that I make um, that, or the service that I provide is that there are not a lot of black women who draw comic books. And I didn't think about that. I didn't really think about that. I didn't want to be the first of four black women who win an Eisner or any of those things. That's not what I was thinking about. I just, I like this thing and I want to make more of that. Uh, I didn't see a lot of superheroes with hips. Something that simple. <laughs> Where are the hips? And I was like, wait a second, if Wonder Woman's going to be lifting a car and throwing it, you know, I, I would expect that she would be a quadzilla. <laughs> and also, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Like I was, in addition to being a musician, I also wanted to be um, an Olympic runner. And that's kind of weird. But um, I really loved like Jackie Joyner Kersey, like 
Flojo was that was my that was my superhero. Just watching her run, I was like, she is a cheetah. She's amazing. Yeah. I like the the people who I saw in. My You're talking about day. Usain Bolt yesterday, actually. Oh. Funnily enough, but continue. He doesn't have right. Names, so continue. <laughs> 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 it's okay that that thing the combination of the things that you love and your influences and the things that you're like yeah this makes me happy and I want to see more of this and even if it's not the best what is and what does it matter I want to pour my heart into this and hopefully someone else will feel it and, and see it too and so I made sure like okay well this is not looking the way I, I want it to look. So how do I uh, become a better artist, get seen, and uh, just make these things? I started um, really focusing on how I could get the look that I want for my work and who makes it. And how can I take a piece of that? Because I don't want to draw just like anybody else. You know, even if I could draw just like my favorite artist, I wouldn't be happy because that's their voice. That arena has been taken care of already. I want to be me on the page. What is that? Uh, I don't know. I'll just kind of do things my way. And as I learn, you know, um, hopefully that will develop into a style because a style is really just your your choice your choices like once you learn the fundamentals you can learn to elaborate it's like learning the lyrics to a song then you can come back in and do your guitar solo but if you try to solo before you know what key you're working in then you're just kind of kind of be all over the place and um and deep. and how the melody goes and what the lyrics are <laughs> saying and how the first verse differs from the second verse and exactly you know. yeah so learning your your part in in the the music of the art that you make is essential to developing your style because that is basically saying this is what you can get from me that you can't get from anybody else and it sounds like a big task but like I said, who you are um, creates your, your signature. And, and you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised at how needed your story, your influence, your, your own personal insight, your philosophy is to whomever it is that uh, is ingesting your art who is whomever is consuming your art i don't know why, why i'm thinking of it like snacks maybe i'm hungry uh, like what <laughs> like snacks oh yeah yeah, yeah. no we were we, that's funny because i said today that if you are if you seek fame before greatness and you mm -hmm. arrive there then you're food <laughs> it's true like those artists uh, it's funny like uh i knew the guys who made um Rihanna's music. I love her. She She's called me in my dream one time. What's that? What'd you say? And I was saying that uh, I I was I was there when she was gosh, she must have been like 15 or 16 years old, already a statuesque goddess from Barbados. And I was like, holy cow, she's really gonna go incredibly far. Um, Farther than anybody thus far, right? And monetarily so far? Definitely. But what ends up happening is like the guys who developed her also developed uh, Monica and um, uh, Brandy and InSync and a lot of different groups. And I think where she may have differed than the others was that she started investing in herself that she wasn't just a product to be, you know, used and consumed and replaced in a few years, that she became an entrepreneur from the experiences that she had. It wasn't just enough for her to be an artist. Uh, she would write her own stuff. She was a dancer. She created a lot of different uh, items f for herself as a brand. And it's weird to think of yourself as a brand, but you know, that's, that's basically what we are. And what does that mean? It's a standard of excellence and quality that is associated with our name. 
And that's really all it is. Uh, and so what people think, you can't necessarily you know, keep changing yourself to fit what people think. Uh, but what it is that you have to bring specifically um, that people come to expect from you. How do I define that for myself? I don't know. Um, I draw a lot of brown ladies. <laughs> That's what I work, do. work with what you know, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I, I've had the opportunity to just encounter some really incredible people, actually from all over the world. You know, not just not, not just black women, but I didn't see a lot of people who were full figured or very very dark skinned or or mixed or any of these other things being associated with beauty and strength or people who are very strong associated with beauty. And of course this was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And I'm like, well, all right, why not me? Why not you? It's a very practical application of Gandhi's famous quote about be the change that you want to see in the world. Like what Absolutely. kind of art do I want to do? Well, what kind of art do I not see? Yeah. And what do I, you know, what, what, what do, what kind of art am I imagining in my head that's not in the world? Bum, there you go. Exactly. It's, it's an opportunity. You know, you could be upset and think of it as a conspiracy against you know, whatever, or you can see it as an opportunity. It's like, oh, well, there aren't any socks made for you know, really large people. Okay, we'll make them. <laughs> Big socks get to, dot com. <laughs> get to sewing. You know, like, oh, I don't see a lot of um, African women in roles that are outside of just, you know, stereotypical things. All right, get to writing. Let's go. <laughs> because that's what our ancestors did, right? Like, here is a, here is a wall. They built a door. They found a ladder or they knocked some things down and made their own way. No way, make a way. And that's, my, my dad was a physicist. He is a physicist, so he doesn't know how to retire. Um, <laughs> so he would teach me that, you know, yeah, you know, people are not going to necessarily like you. They're not going to think that you're equal. They're not going to think that you're enough. And um, that is just a thought. And they are entitled to it. But your work can speak for you. And your work ethic can speak for you. And whatever they say against you, your work will stand stronger than that. And so believe in it and yourself. And know that you might not be necessarily where you want to be right now. But find those teachers. Find those people who know the things that you want to know. So now I'll open it back up to chat. Since I am sharing my screen, I can't exactly see the chat window. Oh, I wasn't chat seeing window. questions. Yeah, I just heard okay. that there's, Seiji has texted me that there's some questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, no, I thought these, I saw these, well, I didn't get to really read them because I was listening to you. Okay, I really, let's see. Uh, I really loved what you said so far. It makes me feel very inspired. My personal, big, my, big, my personal biggest struggle is not being overwhelmed and putting pressure on myself of being great right away. Do you, or did you have these kind of struggles? If so, how or what do you do to combat these intrusive thoughts? This is Karina Gonzalez asking this question, who is a, actually a former high school student of mine and now a friend and has been uh, you know, involved in our summer program. Since Yay, hey Karina. Hi. <laughs> oh gosh, um, unfortunately, that feeling of not being enough never actually goes away. <laughs> <laughs> the problem <Yay>. with <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. The problem with being an artist is that you are a visionary, which means that you see things in great pictures. You see sometimes beyond your capability. You see beyond what's real. You see beyond the present. And so the issue with that is it's always difficult to feel like you're enough and it really you know sometimes you'll get to the point where you're just like hey you know what 
I don't really have time to think about whether or not I'm enough. I've just got to get this done. And what it can do is keep pushing you to learn. And that's kind of what it is for me. It's a, it's a burning, nagging <laughs> irritation of imposter syndrome that I have to combat with that says, hey, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't think you're enough because the person who um, is taking in your work or hiring you, they do. And if you don't value you, no one else will. Yeah. So, so you will be sadly taken advantage of if you don't know your worth. It's like, how do you know that if you just feel insecure about your work and you want it to look a certain way and look at other people and you're just like, oh my God, it's not really looking like that. It's okay. Be patient with yourself. <laughs> It's like, yeah. it's really hard too, because you want to be excellent right now. And it's really, really difficult to be not great at this thing, but practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. How do you get mm. perfect practice? Figuring out what the best possible technique for your objective is. Because and developing that technique. Yeah. I mean, you have to figure exactly. it out and you have to spend the time developing that technique a moment at a time and a, a nuance and a level at a time Absolutely. and not jump forward. It's, 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 exactly. This is uh, again, reinforcing a lot of the things that we've been saying and I'm sorry yeah. I'm interrupting, but I'm no, sorry. no, please. <laughs> you, you're perfectly timed because I was just opening up my brushes. <laughs> All right. Well, we have another question from actually our main thank teacher you. for the day. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Karina. And um, so Paula Walters, Paula Walters Parker is our, our main visual arts teacher um, mm -hmm. for the Art for Progress summer programs, I'll again, for the last three years, and, a, and an old friend of mine, actually, um, also. And she's asking, uh, speaking of getting the look you want, I noticed you do an underdrawing with a light gray tone. Can you talk a little about how you use that as a tool to build your drawing? Absolutely. Um, personal, well, go ahead. You do your thing. Because for I, sure. I am a very sketchy artist. Sometimes when I'm trying to figure out what it is that I want to draw, I don't know yet. And so I will start to create very basic shapes and I will allow my mind to kind of let the vision come into focus because sometimes I have an idea, but it's not very clear, just like a photo that's out of focus that I'm slowly fine tuning. So I'll create the mass in the area that I want and then make decisions on different layers. So I will create my fundamental shapes and get into the framework of what it is that I'm drawing. And then as I go along, I can make decisions to refine and correct. Because the, just like many things, the first draft is not always necessarily the best one. So you'll kind of you know, beat yourself up for not creating a perfect drawing right away when it's okay to sculpt and allow yourself to refine and rewrite and redraw and resketch. So that's what these layers underneath are for me. I can let myself doodle and sketch and figure out where in space I want these things to be. And then I can refine and refine and make decisions and edit uh, as I move along to uh, create the kind of, of look that I want. Now, me personally, I want it to be, um, and I still can be, but I want it to be a really, really fine, fine artist. I want it to be a painter. Uh, but I let somebody get in my head and tell me like, oh, you can't make comics with watercolor. You can't paint comics. And that was just somebody's limitations, uh, expanding those limitations onto me. Uh, and I believed it to be true. So I said, well, I still want this look, but if I can't do it traditionally and I, I don't have the tools or the money to be able to uh, buy better paints or larger canvases or any of those things, you know, what can I do with what I've got? So what do I have? I have Adobe Illustrator and I have Photoshop. Um, vectors uh, enable me to zoom in and make the kinds of very fine, precise lines that I want. 
that I would only be able to achieve if I had a really, really large drawing and lots and lots of paint, which I had neither of. <laughs> so uh, this enables me to cross that barrier until I'm able to get a giant canvas and practice and, um, and do those things. And, and now, you know, now it's a choice. It's like, well, do I want to do those things? Uh, sure, I, I can. I can now. But it's not always practical when I have to send that to a client. I, I think something essential that if I may just add to this is of that, course. you know, your hand is your hand. Like, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, when you draw a freehand analog, uh, it looks like your work, just as when you draw using uh, Photoshop or Illustrator, it looks mm -hmm. like your work, right? And obviously yeah. the interface is different and you're going to have different levels of nuance and different, um, you know, levels of specificity and all that stuff. But you know, the more that you learn different interfaces, I feel like the more that, you know, you become less and less attached to what the interface is and realize that anything to get from point A to point done, or at least point good is, you know, a, uh, is a useful tool. Absolutely. It, learning what the limitations and the, um, the, the pros and cons of each program are, are in incredibly helpful you know, working in watercolor, gouache, or any like live medium, you can create very fluid, very visceral, very emotional artwork because you're working with something that's living, you know, or I say living, but it's, you know, in, in the really real world right. and you can touch it. And, um, but it's hard to control sometimes and to edit. So yes. you know, that's another reason why I do a lot of sketching, you know, measure once, cut twice. No, yeah. measure twice, cut once, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, <laughs> the yeah, other I, way around, I was like, wait a second, no, <laughs> that's absolutely wrong. Flip that one around, yeah. <laughs> Flip it around. Yeah, yeah they, exactly. It's you the know, same so. with music, with analog and digital recording, yes. uh, you know, all that stuff. I was going to say before, the, what made me think of it is that we did a drawing exercise before. We did a, like a life drawing exercise, mm -hmm. and I haven't drawn from life in... I don't know, 20, 30 years. Wow. And my process just until yesterday, actually, when we did our comic characters, I mean, much, much, but um, sitting down and doing it, I was applying a lot of the same things I see you applying now, obviously a different stylistic, you know, approach, but, um, but yeah, as I, as, you know, I, all I had was a, I just had a number two pencil, no eraser, nothing. Uh, yeah. So I just, you know, real, I, you know, as I, once I started, you know, I started with lines and it was mm -hmm. like very clunky and whatever. And then all of a sudden I started to hold the pencil lighter and then just rest it on the page and then not really look at the point where I was, you know, the pencil was hitting, but like sort of look at the bigger thing. And all of a sudden the picture just started flowing out of the pencil. And I was like, Absolutely. oh, this part that was dark before, well, it was only dark in comparison to everything else. And these are just like my initial lines and everything is in flux still you know yeah i i've I, every time i do figure drawing i grow exponentially as an artist because yeah. yeah. what i'm doing is I, i'm not just working from the information in my mind of what i think the body looks like i'm looking at light actually hitting a body and volume so i'm figuring out how to represent that volume in two-dimensional space so sometimes when you're looking at a photo you're getting second-hand information of light hitting a 3D object. Now it's a flattened projection. But when you're looking at life, like you're looking at, I mean, you know, if you do it from video, you, you can kind of do the, the best sure. you can. But when you're sure. looking at a, an actual figure, what's happening is that you are filling your memory banks with how to represent light. You're looking at the, the shape of the light and the shape of the shadow. And that point where I call the from dusk till dawn, there's this chord of where the light hits the dark and interacts. And it's a very dark kind of line and you can follow it down the body. And um, I, I had the opportunity to study with Brian Stelfreeze, who also worked on the Black Panther, a very, very like, incredibly technical comic book illustrator, really fantastic work if you've not heard of him. And uh, he has a live drawing class, or he had one, um, here in Georgia. And what he would say is, um, at that point, that sort of dusk till dawn point where the light hits the shadow, a lot of times he'll use a reddish tone if he's 
representing mm. skin because at that point light is hitting the body and it's showing the blood underneath. Oh, That's the wow. reason that you can tell a mannequin from a live human being because oh. the light is hitting the body and it's showing the blood underneath the skin. So when you add a little bit of red, even if you know they have a very, very dark tone and you want to add a maroon or they have, they're very, very pale and you want to add a pink, just a, a slight little bit of blush will register this person is alive and it, 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 I, I never thought of that before and I was just like oh my god that's incredible that sounds <laughs> so, like ha how you want to mix a bass drum in where you, you're going to feel it more than you're going to hear it you know exactly it's going to impact exactly. you on a subconscious level